Uh, we're now starting the U.S. National Policy se uh, Session in our policy segment. We have a terrific uh, panel of folks who are going to lend their expertise to the question uh, of whether the U.S. should adopt a national policy uh, on healthy longevity as distinct from aging well, and if so, what should one look like? Now, just to disclose uh, our biases, obviously we at the Catalyst Institute feel that we should, but it's probably a good question to ask as to whether what difference that makes, uh, because if we understand that there are good reasons for it, those are additional reasons why we ought to be going to our leaders and trying to uh, get them to uh, uh, help to uh, enact a national policy on, on healthy longevity for all, uh, which is the mission of Catalyst. So I guess, uh, we have an August panel. We have Steve Osted from the University of Alabama, David Fox from Hogan uh, Levels, Linda Freed, Dean of the School of Public Health at Columbia, Matt Kaberlein from the University of Washington, Tom Khalil from uh, Schmidt Futures, Jay Olshansky from University of Illinois in Chicago, and Felipe Sierra, former Director of Aging Biology at NIA, now uh, uh, a, a um, helping uh, establish a similar program or, or aging program in, in Toulouse. So I want to start first, if I may, with a question to the group generally, but first perhaps, uh, I don't, is Linda on? I can't tell from my screen. I, I am. Hi, Hi Linda. Hi, hey, everybody. Um, you've been a, 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 an observer and then an expert in the aging space for decades now. You're not only the dean of the Columbia School of Public Health, you're, you're a dean of this, uh, of this field. Um, is it important for us to have a U.S. national policy on healthy life uh, longevity? Uh, what difference does it make to get one? And if so, what are your thoughts about this? You've heard, I don't know if you heard the pre prior session, in the U.K. they've adopted a goal. Uh, of uh, extending health span for five years by 2035 with greater equitable access, please. So Tina Woods is one of my role models. So absolutely, I heard it. Um, so uh, I think the answer is yes, we need a natural policy. And uh, I'll, I'll briefly try and say why I think that's the case. First, we need to say that we need some goals here that just, uh, leaving things as business as usual in the face of a profound, historically unprecedented change in who constitutes the US population won't work. <laughs> um, so we have a society, we live in a society as do all countries of the world that was designed when life expectancy was at best half of what it currently is and less than half of what it will be. Uh, was not designed for a hundred year life to quote uh, a, a wonderful book. Uh, and it was not designed to understand that we can redesign for better. To have any prayer of moving from what is now uh, a set of systems and institutions which were designed for a life we don't have anymore, uh, to move from that to what we know could be great across a hundred year life, great for individuals and great for society requires national leadership, setting the goals and then leading the kinds of transformations that would make it possible for us to experience the opportunities of longer well, lives. I, I, well, hope that, I hope that we start to have a conversation in this group about if so, what sort of goals should we be setting for ourselves? I just want to quickly turn to Tom Khalil, is Tom on? Yes, I am. Hi, Tom. Um, well, Tom, you are a resident on this panel, a resident expert in setting national policy. You've served in several presidential administrations in the White House, and you've adopted or see, overseen the adoption of uh, policies in science and technology. Um, what is your take with respect to the adoption or prescription? How do we do this? What are important levers to press in order to adopt a national policy on healthy longevity for all? Sure. So. Um, I think it's important to step back and say, uh, what do we mean by policy? Um, and policy is just a mechanism for trying to address uh, public problems. So things that we need to do uh, collectively as opposed to as, as individuals and firms and uh, civil society organizations. 
And policymakers are generally interested in the answer to three questions. One is, uh, where are we today uh, in late 2021? Where would we like to be over the short, medium, and long term? And what actions are we going to take to get there? So to me, the question is not so much, should we have a policy? Uh, but are there some things that we're not currently doing that we should be doing? So let me give you two examples. So it's currently the case that the success rate uh, for the National Institute uh, of Aging for Alzheimer's research is 28%. And for all other fields supported by the NIA, it's 10%. Um, and this is not because I think the Congress um, has any animus to fields like geroscience. It's just that uh, when patient groups go to the Congress, they don't say, I'm getting older. I'd like you to do something about that. They say, you know, my, my loved one has Alzheimer's. So I think that there is an information problem uh, between the scientific community and the Congress with respect to the promise of geroscience research and, and making a direct attack on aging as opposed to individual diseases of, of aging. So I think that's one clear area uh, where we should have a change in public policy. Um, and the second is collaboration uh, between uh, the FDA and the private sector and academia on this discovery and validation of biomarkers uh, that could be used to guide the development and evaluation of different interventions that take advantage uh, of recent advances in, in general science uh, and ultimately uh, for surrogate endpoints in the same way that a drug company can get a statin approved uh, when if they can demonstrate that they can lower cholesterol uh, because of the uh, me our mechanistic understanding of the relationship between cholesterol and, and heart disease. So what, what is the equivalent of that for interventions that are uh, aimed at, uh, at health span? Um, and then the third I would toss in is, how do we address the market failure for supporting clinical trials on uh, interventions that are now off patent? So in the absence of patent protection, um, drug companies are not going to, going to invest uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in, in, uh, in clinical trials. So how we address those, uh, those market failures. So those, those are three specific things. An increase for the NIA budget uh, that is not specifically, that, that, that allows the NIA to support additional research in, in general science, in both basic and translational uh, work, in growing the workforce, uh, um, things like that, in uh, a collaboration between the FDA, industry, and academia on uh, the discovery and validation of biomarkers, and number three, um, addressing the market failure associated with uh, off-patent drugs uh, that, we, that, that we could be using. So those are three things uh, that I don't want to suggest that's complete, but those are like three things that I think should be on the, on the policy agenda. Well, those are terrific uh, framing questions or issues because we're going to be talking about that uh, in the rest of the session. Um, but uh, I, I guess just an open call, are there others who want to speak to the issue of uh, the importance of having a national policy and or, or response to Tom's comments? Uh, the next topic I'd like to move to after sort of this open call is in any policy you have funding uh, or reasons why you adopt them. Um, and one of them is that, is it going to cost too much money or is it going to save us money, et cetera? And I, I want to call on Jay, sort of giving him a heads up to speak to the longevity dividend update now, but sort of a closing off of this first segment of the discussion, are there others who want to say some uh, comment on uh, the need for a policy and on uh, Tom's comments? Just raise your hand or start speaking. Steve, Austin. Yes, and, and listening to the, to the people from the UK talk about the APPG, um, longevity policy of a target of a five-year increase in health span uh, by 2035. That seems to me like the kind of target 
that makes for good policy, good policy um, motivation anyway. The issue with it is that I think it's largely irrelevant to the types of geroscience advances that most of us are thinking of. The easy way to reach that target is by pulling up the bottom. And we all know how to do that. It's just a question. I mean, one thing we've learned from COVID is just knowing how to solve a problem doesn't mean that people are going to be willing to solve it. But if we pulled up the bottom of the health span group, we could achieve that. I mean, Japan is already five year longer healthy lifespan than we are actually eight years longer. So I think there's, there's, there's two kind of antagonistic things going on. There's one is new scientific advances that could help us move the human body into places it's never been. But the other is in raising the health of the people the, in ways that we already know how to do, but for some reason we can't get people to do them. I see Matt and then uh, David Fox have uh, hands up. Matt. Uh, Thanks. Yeah. Um, so, so I just want to uh, expand a little bit on a point that um, Tom raised, which I think is, is really critical, which is that, and, I, and, and Steve was alluding to this as well, which is that I, I believe that in, in order for any real healthy longevity policy initiative to be successful, one of the pillars has to be to approach that from the perspective of the biology of aging. And, and what I mean by that is to get away from the disease specific or disease first mindset, which is really, you know, what has dominated biomedical research and pharmaceutical and medical practice for the last century, right? Waiting until people are sick and then trying to cure their individual disease. Um, my concern is that, that, you know, if we don't get that message out, that we may very well get a healthy longevity or healthy aging um, policy approach. But, it, but if that's missing, it's going to be, I think what Steve was alluding to, it's going to be bringing up the bottom 5% instead of bringing the entire population along. Um, so I really just want to emphasize that idea that, you know, we need, we need to really get, get the message out in a way that's digestible to the target audiences that targeting the biology of aging is really 21st century medicine. And that's where we need, we need to go. And then you have the opportunity to really delay, you know, multiple diseases of aging at the same time and potentially even reverse functional declines that have, have already happened. And we know from the biology side that that's possible. So I think getting that message out um, is, is going to be critically important. Uh, that, that, as, that's a really important point. And I think uh, maybe it tells us that we need to be thinking in terms of a short term and a longer term um, uh, goals for this group. Uh, as uh, the UK group said, by uh, tackling smoking and alcohol and air pollution and so forth, you can get those kinds of gains. Uh, but we're, uh, Matt, you wrote an eloquent op-ed, is what I kind of call it, in response to uh, sort of the establishment approach to ARPA-H, and we need to talk about that in the, in the funding section of this uh, talk. Uh, David Fox, you raised your hand next, or that, that was, I saw your hand next. Go, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh, so so just, let me just bring this down a bit to the regulatory level. Uh, um, so we heard yesterday from FDA, um, you know, really excellent presentations, but but their their kind of capstone point was we're not a barrier to this sort of innovation. We're just about the evidence. Show us the evidence, and the barriers go down. Um, and that is, um, you know, to put it politely, it's a truthful statement, but it also is a bit misleading. And it's misleading because I, I think we've seen this very clearly over the last couple of years. Um, how much the values of the review teams influence the assessment of the data. Um, and, uh, it, you know, we, there's all sorts of ways to express it, but we can't help but re remember that they're humans at FDA. They, they have biases, they have emotions, um, and they never have all of the science that they want. And so in tough cases, they're always making a judgment call, and that judgment call is influenced by their own values. Um, and we can, I think, talk about this later in the panel about how we can start to influence their values as other patient groups have done um, in the past. But I think that, you know, the yeah. fastest, the express lane to changing the values of the regulators is through the announcement of a national policy through, through congressional action. Yeah. So that, that's, I think, another reason to, to 
you know, head in the direction of a national policy. Another way of putting it is if it gives the regulators cover to make the judgment call that Mission. we actually want to make. Right. Um, because always the data will never, it will never be the full picture. There will always be a judgment call it at the end of the road. That's the nature of regulatory science. Um, so that, that's another reason for national policy. But I, I am interested in talking later about how we can start trying to influence and inform the agency's values without you know, going through the hill, going directly to the agency. Uh, thank you, David. I saw next hands, uh, Felipe and then Linda and then, uh, so Felipe? Yeah, so, so actually uh, what I was going to say was uh, pretty much covered, but uh, I think that uh, one important thing, and we're going to be talking about this when we talk about, uh, about funding, is uh, so the advocacy that uh, the Alzheimer's Association and others did for the NFA is uh, definitely what got, got us to this point where the, there's the, such a disparity in uh, funding levels. So ad advocacy is a... a clear thing that we have to do. And for that, we do need a, a national policy. So I think that that is a, I don't think that anybody in this panel would question that we need a policy. The question is what should go into that policy and what are the, the goals? I think uh, at some point with uh, Jay and Steve and a few others, we did try to do something where we also set up, okay, we want to increase lifespan by that much in, uh, in, ten, in so many years. Uh, we didn't get very far uh, because we're not the right advocates. Uh, we know our science, but we're not advocates. We need we need professional advocates. That's that would be my point. Thank you, Linda. Oh, <clears throat> I I would say that it's um, desirable to have only one focus, but I think we need a dual focus on national policy if we can really achieve a health span that approximates our longer lifespans or even extend both so that people are living long life with health. One is on the, the huge potential of the geroscience uh, uh, science, which has been discussed, but it has to be partnered with uh, reinvested in and redesigned public health system that delivers the conditions in which everybody can be healthy across the life course so that we're investing in what we now know scientifically is possible, investing at every age and stage of life in prevention and in health futures for everybody. That needs to be invested in as much as the geroscience, but jointly with the geroscience in order to create a healthy population and not widen health disparities and democratize the opportunity of health for everyone. Mm -hmm. So you need a dual set of messages here. Um, the two can amplify each other, but one without the other. Well, um, well, certainly I don't think the geroscience will succeed without a, a strong public health system. Uh, public health may succeed uh, to a considerable degree without the geroscience, but the combination both. Terrific. Uh, uh, Jay, can we go to you actually for whatever comment or question you have, but also to uh, help answer for us and for others who are watching? Um, is this going to be cost too much or are we going to save them all kinds of money? Why should they adopt a national uh, um, policy? Jay, please. Well, first of all, I really enjoy listening to all my friends um, and seeing all of you, uh, number one. So, um, yeah. So boy, a lot of issues just came up and uh, Steve, I think, touched on something really important here. I mean, if indeed all one does is set a goal of a five-year health span extension, then you don't need any sort of aging intervention to accomplish that. You can accomplish that um, in other ways. Look, um, we've created this, this dilemma uh, for ourselves. You know, we live very long lives. We've, we've succeeded in our effort to, to achieve a, a, a life extension. Um, you know, as I've said in some of my own writings, um, we should declare victory. Um, we won uh, the battle. And now the focus should be on making us live healthier longer. And how do we do that? And, you know, that's what Felipe um, and Matt were saying, look, it's not going to come about by going after one disease at a time. It's going to have to require a new paradigm, which is, you know, what Tom was talking about, this 
new paradigm of, of geroscience and finding a way to modulate the biological process of aging. It's the only way forward. In fact, there's a danger of, in my view, of not taking this particular route. And the danger is not just in terms of increasing the number of people that can make it out to older ages frail um, with some high level of frailty uh, in disability, it could actually get worse, significantly worse, if we don't take this particular uh, route of, um, of going after uh, aging itself. Having a, a particular target, um, I'm not quite sure that that's the right target, by the way, of extending health span by five years, I'd probably would be more interested in focusing in on reducing uh, um, the period of frailty and disability, whatever uh, metric um, we're gonna use uh, for that. I mean, you know, it's been referred to as compression of morbidity, but to me, I, I'd, be, I'd be much more uh, interested in that because then you're dealing with a dynamic of the combination of lifespan and health span extension. Jay, uh, so how would we know that we've succeeded until we find out when everybody has finished their lives? Uh, well, you, 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 you generate um, um, something that you can measure on an annual basis, which would be lifespan and health span, and you look at the difference uh, between them, and that gives you a sense of whether or not you're accomplishing what you want to accomplish. Keep in mind, what I'm suggesting is, is that uh, going after one disease at a time probably would, would it may make us live a little bit longer, but we may experience this larger increase in frailty and disability. We may not get what we want as a result. And so I think the goal is to really uh, reduce the distance between those. Um, to answer your other question, my goodness, uh, there've been two papers written on this, one by Dana Goldman and colleagues, including myself. Um, and then this recent article that came out in Nature, which suggested that that, that the uh, economic benefits are much greater than uh, we thought, and I agree with them. Um, in fact, uh, I think we underestimated dramatically the economic benefits. So is there, is there a, a, a benefit associated with, with successful efforts to modulate aging and, go, and um, fund geroscience? Oh my goodness, um, absolutely. That is such an easy uh, argument to make. Um, can we, can we keep his hand up, but I know he's <laughs> going to take it from there. But, but can you assure the, pub, uh, the attendees now and the policymakers who may watch this uh, recording that the net cost, uh, the net benefit, net of entitlement benefits and so forth, a lot of other jiggling that happens, uh, they're going to be saving so much money as opposed to, no, you're, you're, you're afraid of it's going to cost money, but it's not. Can we assure well, what, people what, that? What would cost a whole lot more would be not succeeding in an effort to modulate aging and having a lot more unhealthy older individuals. That's perhaps the easiest metric uh, to, to illustrate what the consequences are of failure and then, of course, the consequences of success. And I know Felipe is going to take it from here. Felipe, please. You're on yeah, so, so actually, I, I completely agree with with what has been said, actually, uh, as Jay, uh, we have known all along that just to be on the safe side, the economic benefit has been uh, counted down just to, to not overpromise, right? So that's uh, that's the case. But uh, I think that's important. Also, what we said about how we're gonna do. I think uh, either Jay or Matt said not the long, not the longevity. Uh, it, put a, a goal of increasing longevity by five years in 2035. It's not a very convincing one. I think that you hit the right thing where what we need to do is develop, uh, uh, diminish disability. I think that's a critical, critical thing because that people see it as a burden, not only the person, but also at the level of, uh, of cost, right? So. Diminishing disability, I think, is a critical issue. And to, to be honest, that's a, that's the purpose of the project I'm working on here in France, which is what actually what, what uh, interested me. They were not interested in diseases; they were interested in, on health and uh, frailty, disability. That's that seems to me the, uh, the right goal to pursue. Steve, yeah, I think there's a there's an excellent uh, analogy here with with climate change. And that is, we can see what's coming. We've been able to see what's coming for a long, long time. 
And if we don't do anything about it, the consequences are going to be catastrophic. And I think uh, it's something that that you don't know what to do when people see something coming and know it's coming and know it's going to be catastrophic if there are no actions taken, but yet they take no action. So I think this is, you know, there's two signature issues of the 21st century, climate change and the aging global population. And both of them really need to be addressed or we're going to be in a terrible, terrible situation in a couple of decades. Great analogy. Linda? So I think thinking about the cost of inaction is very important. And, and a huge part of the costs of inaction go well beyond health, but are enabled by health for not being disabled, not being frail. Um, because actually what having an older population offers, which is unprecedented in human history, is uh, if people are healthy, is a population of people who want to leave the world better than they found it, who can work if they want to, but also can bring their immense kind of emotional and uh, experience assets to bear to create a better society and a better world. And older adults, the science is very clear, have an immense number of assets to bring to this, uh, forming a, a scale of positive, pro-social, generous and generative social capital that no society has ever seen before, if they're healthy, and, and can make a profound difference in the future of our children and subsequent generations with their energies as well to uh, saving our environment and lots of other things. But, but societies, if people are healthy and not disabled and not frail, uh, can hugely benefit from what we've created in terms of longer lives. I, I do want to turn to the question of uh, funding and funding priorities, which I think a lot of geroscientists are quite interested in. But Matt, you have the last word on this, uh, this segment. Thanks. I just wanted to um, make a comment on Steve's analogy because I, I think it's a good one, but it's it's not a it's not a perfect fit, I think, for where we're at with aging research and geroscience in the sense that, you know, I think the average person understands the climate change problem and and what the what the causes are at least to the extent that any of us really understand that whereas the common the, the common person doesn't really understand aging biology and geroscience once we get outside of our bubble most people don't don't really know what we're talking about when we're talking about modulating the biology of aging so i think we have a communication um, challenge, which we're starting to get better at. We're starting to see <coughs> aging biology and geroscience get into the popular uh, realm um, and people are hearing about it, still really hasn't gone mainstream. Um, and so I think that's an area where as a field, we, we need to continue to pay attention and try to communicate to the general public, to policymakers, to regulators, politicians, to the extent that we can, you know, what what we're doing, why this approach um, has a lot of promise, how it differs from approaches that have been taken previously, um, so that we can actually get more recognition of what, what the potential value might be to a geroscience approach. So I do see a couple of questions. We do have a Q&A section that's scheduled for uh, later in the, uh, the session. I wonder if I could pose to the panel the question of what should be the, uh, the research priorities I know that no one wants to sit, be here and say uh, you should have less money, Alzheimer's or cancer or what have you, but we have uh, certainly argued, give us some sliver, a bigger sliver to look, see whether we can do something that's not a whack-a-mole approach, to, if we can uh, approach all of these diseases, chronic diseases all at once. So I know that uh, a number of people on this panel have uh, been, well, probably been talking about this for years, but I know that in May at NIA and NIH, there was an effort to talk about defining you know, the, a national vision for uh, research priorities and budgets. Uh, this, is the, this is the time for any discussions, hands up on people who wanna talk about, but I want specifics, not sort of, we should have more money, but how much more money, why, what do you wanna use it for? And why should the country uh, spend this, dedicate this? This is post COVID, so it's a good time, if you will, uh, uh, not to waste a, uh, uh, a crisis to see whether we can get the needed money for this sort of uh, activity. 
Uh, we've had ARPA-H and other things that have been uh, proposed, so that's all good, but the latest um, current interim news is that it's out of the current budget. And the uh, question is six billion, six and a half billion dollars, maybe it should be three. So those are things we, this is the session to talk about it. Felipe, please. Yeah, several things in there. So starting with the last one, ARPA-H, I think that in a, in a sense, maybe it is an opportunity that it got dropped. Maybe it will come back later. I hope it will come back later. And what happens, I, I felt that we missed an opportunity there. ARPA age was going in the way of same old, same old. This put money to cancer, Alzheimer's, etc. I We should have made a point to, to put a geoscience in the middle. So maybe by dropping it and then maybe we'll have another chance later. The other thing is, yes, we do need more money and there's reasons why. And I, I mean, just what was mentioned at the beginning by Tom, uh, Alzheimer's got a pay line of 28. That's because there's more money, right? But what has happened in the field is that the field got larger, got bigger and got stronger because there was more money. So. While it used to be that it was all about ABIT and DAO, now it's about zero science and other things like that. So that's what we need to happen. The last thing I would like to say is uh, maybe patting myself in the back, but the, what we did with the zero science interest group uh, when I was at the NIH was an interesting uh, approach because what we wanted, we did not ask for more money. We made a point that we were not asking for more money. What we wanted was to get recognition by other institutes that aging was important for their purposes. And the result was within the first five years, there was a doubling of research on aging being funded by institutes that were not the NIA. So there's an, an, a way to increase the, the pot without increasing the pot. Matt, please. Thanks. So, um, I mean, I think we should be ambitious. And I agree with what Felipe said. I think that, um, you know, now that it looks like ARPA-H is not going to happen, that it, it's disappointing in some sense for biomedical research, but it may be an opportunity for geroscience. We anticipate there will be new leadership coming in at NIH. That may also be a, an opportunity for geroscience. So I think we want to continue to get the message out there. And, and you know, from my perspective, I would say, you know, we should go for a geroscience moonshot. I, you know, if, if I if I could control what happened, which obviously I can't, but if I could, we would have a new institute, maybe within NIH, maybe outside of NIH, with a budget that's comparable to NCI. I think that's perfectly reasonable, given the um, the importance of of uh, the biology of aging. You could certainly make an argument that the budget should be larger than NCI, but if we say six and a half billion dollars, um, I think that's a good place to start. And so I think that those are the kinds of um, ideas that we should be talking about and, and putting out there and really trying to make the case. Jay? Um, yeah, so this idea of a moonshot, um, keep in mind, we came to Washington years ago, and, and I think Tom probably can provide insights into this better than anyone else, because we came to Washington with the idea specifically of a moonshot. I don't know how many years ago um, that was, if you recall, and uh, President Obama was considering this, I think, two years before the end of his term. So what did we do wrong and what do we need to do different to make this happen? Tom? That's, yeah, that's a question for Tom. By Tom the way. Khalil. Yeah, so um, I think it's time to make another run at this. Uh, I don't think we can go from where we are today to uh, you know, uh, an NCI-sized uh, initiative. Um, I think you would want to do something that explores the question of what is the absorptive uh, capacity of, of the research community um, so that you're not throwing more money at the research community than they can usefully use. But I think that there is uh, an information problem, uh, which is that the geroscience research community has either not had the time or the inc inclination or the capacity uh, to explain to policymakers uh, that we might be able to make a, an attack on the underlying mechanisms of aging and therefore delay the onset of multiple chronic diseases. I think that is the, there is growing support for that hypothesis. 
I think there's more excitement uh, within the research community about this. Um, there are more, uh, you know, uh, researchers from mainstream institutions who are willing to raise their hand and saying, this is the explicit goal of my lab. Uh, but I don't think that there's been a concerted effort uh, to uh, convey that message to policymakers. So I, I think that there is an information problem um, and it is exacerbated by um, the sort of uh, the, the important role that patient groups uh, play uh, in the politics of biomedical research, which is that particularly members of Congress, less so the executive branch, but members of Congress are primarily hearing uh, from uh, individual disease-oriented uh, patient groups. And they you know, do play and should play a, a critical role, uh, but I, don't, I think they're gonna struggle to convey this particular message, which is that there may be an opportunity to deal with uh, multiple diseases at once uh, with this new uh, geroscience informed approach. I don't think we can go from where we are to six and a half billion dollars overnight. Uh, so I, I think that there should be a strategy for uh, ramping this up. Um, but I do think that the community has to have an answer to the question, uh, okay, if we did give you if we did give you additional resources, uh, what would you do with it? So what are the important, open fundamental questions. Uh, what types of research should we be supporting in, uh, in clinical and translational research? What should we be doing in biomarkers? Um, should we be making an investment uh, in uh, pre-aged animal models or animal, a broader range of animal models than just uh, mice? Um, what sort of research and data infrastructure uh, do we need to support? How are we going to address the uh, market failure? Um, is there a role for the FDA regulatory science uh, program in terms of creating new regulatory pathways for geroscience therapies? Um, so really beginning to uh, have an answer to the question, well, if we gave you additional resources, what would we get out of it and what would you spend on it? And to have a bottom-up rationale uh, for what the community could actually absorb given the number of uh, researchers that are currently in the field and having a plan for uh, ramping up that investment in a responsible way as opposed to just throwing a lot of money at the field. I hope we start to get at the, those, that, that request for a wish list of things to do in what order of priority. Just a quick comment. I hope everyone here and the attendees had a chance to listen to Newt Gingrich who said, it was at least one member, a former member of Congress who uh, totally gets the geroscience approach of uh, uh, not going about a whack-a-mole uh, uh, procedure for uh, attacking chronic diseases. And I think, I hope that we'll have another shout out from a current member of Congress uh, uh, next uh, tomorrow. But Matt, you are next, please. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just want to say I agree completely with what Tom said, that that if we had $6.5 billion tomorrow and tried to figure out how to spend it on geroscience, we'd be we'd struggle and it would be inefficient. So I agree it needs to ramp up. I, I think, though, um, that that we can make the case that the pot that could be used efficiently is probably bigger than a lot of people think. I think Felipe alluded to this, that there are now many scientists who are funded by NIDDK, NCI, and other institutes who are doing what we would call geroscience research. Their research is founded on discoveries from the biology of aging. And so maybe there's, maybe there's some value in trying to estimate you know, how much of that research budget is actually being spent on geroscience and the inefficiencies that actually go along with having those grants come through these other institutes where the reviewers don't have expertise in geroscience and the administrators don't have expertise in geroscience and the value that would come from creating a standalone institute for geroscience, maybe, that's how I would do it again. Um, I think that there are some, some gains in efficiency that come there. The other area where there's a huge lack of funding right now are clinical trials in geroscience and that costs a lot of money. So I actually think the budget that could be used effectively and efficiently um, for geroscience research is, is probably a little bit bigger than what people think about, even in the short term. Um, the other 
question that I, there's more question that I wanted to ask about the moonshot the first time around that I think um, Jay was was talking about. I've wondered and I've heard that that one of the challenges there was that there wasn't buy-in from NIH leadership for that particular moonshot. And so again, I want to come back to the idea that there may be an opportunity with the change in NIH leadership um, to actually have an advocate for JRO science. I think that would be hugely important and impactful for the field and for human health if we really had an advocate as the head of NIH for JRO science. If uh, Jay, Felipe, Steve, you want to open up your mics and have a discussion about that, I saw a lot of nodding heads, not to pile on old NIH, but if there's an opportunity, let's talk about it. Well, if I may, if I may um, so two things are actually, one unrelated to funding, but it was mentioned by Tom actually that uh, people come with uh, their sick uh, Alzheimer's patients to Congress. What we need to do is to convince finally AARP that they should do more than provide uh, wheelchairs. AARP has never bought into the concept of, uh, of uh, geoscience. They really into helping the disabled, really. And that's, that needs to be changed. But actually, coming back to, uh, to the issue of uh, how much money you get, okay, we did go through that at the NIA when the funding for Alzheimer's increased dramatically. And to be honest, and maybe this is not politically correct for me to say, but we were funding really bad science because we had to spend the money, okay? So our funding line for Alzheimer's in some lines was up to 40% or something like that. The, that's not sustainable. However, the community grew up to the challenge and now it's getting better. Now it's still 28, so it's pretty high. But it is, it is a, lot, a lot that can be absorbed by the, by the community. And um, it, it takes a couple of years. And as Matt said, yes, clinical trials is a in critical area, and that by itself absorbs a lot of money. So there are some, some big projects that need to be uh, considered. I mean, a continuation of uh, the dog project, I think is uh, critical, for example, and it takes a lot of money. Clinical trials take a lot of money. So there's a lot that can be absorbed. Uh, but Tom, but no, you're right. Of course, we're not gonna go to 6.5 million. <laughs> from, a lay, from a lay perspective, uh, gee, the TAME trial has been discussed for years. Can't we just get someone to fund it and start it? A rapamycin uh, uh, trial, a whole bunch of stuff that's easily on yes, the list. Yes, all, all of that is waiting for funding to come, and they're valuable approaches. And um, okay, I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> Steve. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I, I will say that, that, that there was a move and we did go to the NIH leadership at that point and got, and got no support. I think because uh, that person didn't really believe it when we said, we're not here to pick your pocket. We, we, we just want your, your, your support, uh, not your money, but your support. And he, and he didn't believe it. But I, I think there's a really important lesson that we can learn here from the COVID-19 experience, which is one of the things that we have learned how to do is we've learned how to put together a big clinical trial quickly and cheaply. And there's a lot of ways to reduce the cost of these things with smart technology. We, we don't need to be stuck in the old clinical trial realm necessarily where you have certain sites and people go to sites. There's, there's huge advances in that that we've just learned over the past year and a half. And I think we could really take advantage of that in moving forward with geroscience. Uh, Linda? So what? We started out by talking about should there be national pol a national policy on, on what? Um, what? One of the, so I, I'd like to link this back to, to what our national policy goals should be. Um, and one of the challenges that strikes me in, in general science, which is profound, is that it takes us beyond the disease era while offering to prevent diseases. Um, many people have said that the National Institutes of Health is actually the National Institute of, Dis Institutes of Disease. I think I'm quoting somebody on the screen. Uh, <laughs> um, 
And, and so there, I think the framing of what the goal, aggregate goal should be, should link back to our national policy goal, which is not just to prevent disease, but by delaying aging to also build longer lives with health and well-being. At least with health, well-being comes separately. And David? Oh, so, I'm sorry, Linda, go ahead. So how so we're talking about a prevention agenda that go that is countercultural, goes beyond the, the disease framework that the National Institutes of Health were established for. And it's really a reframing. And so uh, when you're talking about policy, it just makes me wonder if it should be limited to geroscience or sh it should be inclusive of geroscience in the broader agenda of what, about what we're trying to accomplish through science. For That's an excellent point, Linda. And just to give you a sense of the Catalyst Institute, which is organizing this Metabesity Conference, mm -hmm. our mission is to accelerate the translation of emerging geroscience and other sciences into material accessible gains in public health by preventing chronic diseases and extending healthy longevity. It's a mouthful, but it's trying to get at different elements of the whole picture, not just geroscience, uh, research and development. And completely agree with you. David, please. So, so um, Peter Thiel has a much maligned Roth IRA with $5 billion in it. <laughs> so he could solve his public relations problem if he just turned that over to our research. Um, but more seriously, on, on, on the private side and the market failure issue, um, we, we do have experience, a lot of experience with incentivizing the industry. And I think as, as others have pointed out, a lot of those um, examples are not a good fit here because of lack of patent protection. Um, the fact that the substances, the interventions that we would develop would have to be um, so safe that they would have to have been used over a long period of time. So unprotectable, ubiquitous substances. Um, but, the, but the models that have worked at, um, have been the models that allow for transfer of the exclusivity. So, so for example, um, we've incentivized uh, development of uh, interventions for rare pediatric diseases, for tropical diseases, and for biodefense by allowing for the award of a priority review voucher that can then be sold on the open market. And they, those sell for about $100 million. So that's one way to, to get at the market failure issue. We, 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 we tried to solve that with antibiotics. I think antibiotics are probably the closest example to a market failure um, in this area. And, and the solution was a five-year extension of exclusivity under the GAIN Act. And that has turned out to be a tremendous failure. You know, giving people more exclusivity for a product that shouldn't be used, should be locked in a vault, doesn't, doesn't help. But I think the answer, if you really want to um, really motivate the pharma industry, and we've, we've seen in even small incentives, six months of pediatric exclusivity really moves the industry. Um, that some, and this would take a legislative effort, but some, mo some model around um, an award of exclusivity that can be transferred to uh, uh, another product would, 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 would get right at that market failure issue. So, so David, uh, let's finish up the discussion about public funding and research priorities. You, you, don't, want to, you don't want to get, you don't want to go after Peter Thiel's uh, uh, and Jeff, dollars. And Jeff Bezos and Altos Labs. <laughs> and, uh, we actually want to talk about market failures, but not only uh, with respect to uh, uh, generic drugs uh, being repurposed for general protective purposes, but also misalignments between payers. Uh, because right now we have a payment system, if you're not a single payer system, where people are being invited to pay for interventions today that are most likely are going to benefit people years later, another payer somewhere else. Once we call out those problems, maybe we can come up with some interesting fixes for them. But I, um, I saw a couple of other hands up. I'm sorry. Uh, if, if we've sort of gone through the <laughs> public funding route, then maybe we can, maybe there's a good time. Uh, Jay, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, so actually, it, it just seemed to me that that um, we've crystallized probably what we need to do to make this happen. I mean, look, I, we, I think we were ahead of our time, I think, when we 
uh, when we had those meetings with the NIH director several years ago, um, what would what would make this work? I think three things, um, and I'd like to see it happen. And we were so close. Uh, and you've already mentioned one of them: the NIH director giving his or her blessing, saying this is this is the way to go. This is the new method of primary prevention that we need need to consider. Um, we don't necessarily need NIH money, as Steve said. We didn't need it before. I'd love to see a moonshot um, buy-in by the president. This is what we tried uh, years ago, a presidential buy-in to a moonshot. Um, I don't know if we want to call it a, a moonshot, but a presidential buy-in to this particular line of reasoning would be extraordinarily powerful if combined with the NIH director, and then a detailed plan like Felipe and others were saying, which we have. Um, I mean, there, there are multiple plans out there where there's one that we created years ago that needs to be uh, updated and modified. But I think those three things um, would actually push us much further and much faster along this road uh, than uh, we've accomplished so far. It just seems to have crystallized from this discussion. Okay, can I get tactical for a moment? I mean, this is the fact that uh, you had um, the Francis Collins and Eric Lander and others uh, writing an article about all the wonderful things that ARPA H could do, uh, maybe finally win the war on cancer, and by the way, revolutionary platforms and so forth. Not a single bullet item on a geroscience approach. And Matt Caberline wrote this eloquent, uh, was it The Hill or one of the publications that made the point that I think all of us were kind of you know, very uh, saying we got to write something, or et cetera. So, so far, uh, we haven't any evidence that the president's science advisor or the president uh, are, partic are particularly, um, you know, uh, influenced by this approach. Uh, how can we get there? Maybe it's Tom Khalil or we, we need to bring pressures, not pressures, <laughs> education to bear so that we're able to smooth the pathway for exactly what you're saying, to make it a criterion of sorts for selection of a new director and to have the current administration put its muscle behind this like it's put its muscle behind the war against cancer. Any thoughts, discussion? I think it would be useful to pull together the most compelling uh, why now uh, evidence. So I, I think the thing that is different from the first round of conversations uh, is that uh, since those visits, uh, you've had accumulation of, of evidence. Now, granted, a lot of it is in uh, mice, and we all know that there's a big difference between mice and humans. Uh, but I do think that, A, there's a lot more uh, fundamental research, and there's some you know, very early stage uh, you know, preclinical activities going on. So I think a sober, uh, you know, synthesis of, of, uh, of, the, of the evidence and the compelling uh, research directions, both on the fundamental side, on the tool development side, on biomarkers, on early stage clinical research, uh, I think could, could make a difference. I do think that there is always a, there's a balancing act between getting people excited about the field and sort of, you know, overhype and, and overpromising. And I, I think that's something that the field has had to deal with, not, not only from the, you know, scientific community, but from the adjacent community of uh, autodidacts uh, who are excited about the field and well, the Catalis Institute uh, certainly intends to follow up this conference and this session with white papers and various other things to sort of uh, bring together those ideas. We don't have to be the, the uh, tip of the spear, but we'd love to see a j joint exercise to uh, bring those um, perspectives to bear on, on the White House and to, uh, to everyone else. I wonder if, David, we're actually going to switch gears and talk about not the, the funding, but the non-funding aspects of a national policy? What are some things that we want to uh, um, see enacted or what should we be paying attention to? And certainly market failures would be one of them. Regulatory reforms. I mean, we've heard in this uh, conference and in other venues that uh, maybe the FDA should uh, be, um, there should be a parallel agency that does things like this, or there should be a new center or a direct office or something that uh, has to do with aging uh, 
approaches, therapeutics, or do we, does aging need to be classified as a disease or a condition and uh, the FDA given the uh, permission and the authorization to the mandate to uh, consider uh, safe and effective uh, evidence about safety and effectiveness. So uh, David, let me turn to you first, if I may, and uh, have you talk about some of your thoughts. We've been talking about these as part of our project health span for the Catalyst Institute. Uh, can you comment on things like uh, non-funding aspects of a national policy like regulatory reform or, or addressing market failures? Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, on the market failures, I think that is legislative primarily to, to get real incentives that will make the, the, the industry interested. Um, but, but um, you know, on, on things that are within our control that we can, we can do now, um, you know, we talk about a moonshot, but there's a lot of underlying hard work that, that goes on over a long period of time before you get to the point of actually, um, you know, running your moonshot mission. And, and I think that there's a lot of grassroots work that can be done at FDA immediately. Um, so as we, we, we've experienced, uh, the patient voice has become much more prominent at FDA. There is a large scale program now going on at the agency through 2022 um, to develop a framework for getting input from patients in a systematic way. And then almost every major disease um, state is um, uh, weighing in and most are getting uh, stakeholder meetings. And one, one thing we, can't, we could try to do is integrate uh, pre-disease patients into um, the, those guidance development pr processes and try to institutionalize within FDA the concept that when you hear from patients on what they, what they would like from a therapy, what benefits they're interested in, what risks they're willing to tolerate, that, that the voice of the, the pre-disease patients should also, also be heard. And FDA should start thinking about that. Now, that's not something they, they normally think about, and prevention claims are rare. Um, but I think it, it's a cultural issue. I don't, as much as it is a, a regulatory framework issue. And I, we heard yesterday a lot of interest in trying to just steamroll over the regulatory framework and create a brand new one. And that is a valid approach, but it's a multi year approach that requires legislation. But we can start influencing their values now. Um, and become something of a, of a squeaky wheel. Um, so I think participating in the patient voice and, and patient, what's called patient-focused drug development and reminding FDA that pre-disease uh, individuals are also patients, we're not just people, um, I think could, could, could be you know, very beneficial and just to, to get the conversation started. And you might even, Thomas, you know, think about an audacious goal of saying, you know, with it, this time next year when we're holding this conference, we hope that this conference aligns with a stakeholder meeting for preventive uh, health. Uh, and, and we have to actually just go to FDA and ask. And if we're turned down, um, we'll figure out why we were turned down and do it better the next time. And if we keep on getting turned down, that gives us more ammunition to go to the Hill or go to the White House and say, FDA believes it can. not FDA won't just, they'll give us a reason. And the reason will be something about it's outside their authority and then we'll know what authority we need to go and get. So we really have to exhaust what's available to us at the agency level. I, th I think that's, that's critical. Steve? Uh, yeah, so I actually went to the FDA about five or six years ago. I forget, Jay, if you were on that trip or not, but the whole idea was to get their support in principle for the Metformin trial. And we found absolutely no problem with convincing them that if we couch this in the terms of preventing three serious diseases, that they would agree in principle to consider it. And in fact, within five, we planned for days how we were gonna present this argument. Within five minutes, they'd said, okay, that's fine. Now let's talk about the experimental details. So I think we, I think we can work with them. Now the problem is of course that there's membership turnover and leadership turnover, and you never know how the next group is going to go. But it didn't strike me that there was a huge insuperable impediment at the FDA that we needed to, to overcome, that they, they were willing to work with us. Linda? So 
I'm, I'm struck that as we talk about the NIH, as we talk about the FDA, as we talk about other um, low side for national policy, that we're, we're trying to confront two big problems. One is that um, our systems were not built for the lives we're really getting to live, which are longer. And secondly, that the science has outstripped our regulatory or research approaches um, or goals. Um, and, and across the board, the, the fact that we're living 100 year lives is not part of our vision in, in our policy development or in order to value it. So it, it makes me wonder, maybe Tom look, looking at you, Tom Seo, if we need um, an, an aggregate approach to actually change our policy narrative to embrace the fact that we're now living longer lives. The science tells us there, there are possibilities to create health through those longer lives. Um, and, and we need to make a real shift in our framework. Uh, Linda, I've got to respond. I see you, Felipe, you have a comment, but I have to respond to you, Linda, you're absolutely right. Um, I'm not from the drug development industry. I'm, I'm a recovering lawyer, actually. So uh, when I look at the system of regulation, I see that somewhere we're headed for molecular medicine, precision wellness, et cetera, Star Trek medicine. Hopefully we don't have to wait till the 24th century, but we're gonna get there. And the question is how do we transition from a system that uh, noticed phenotypically sort of diseases presenting before uh, people whose names are now on their diseases, you know? And I look at evolutionary biology, I see Linnaean classifications being uh, substituted by molecular biology. We're gonna understand at the molecular and the cellular levels, things that are starting down a path that if left unchecked is gonna show up in terms of diseases. The problem is that um, uh, both the regulators and uh, the practice of medicine and the pharma and the marketing and the sales of drugs and so forth, they can't really focus on this because the FDA requires a, sort of a field function or survival criteria. And by definition, if things are going on at the cellular and the molecular levels, you're not gonna see them for a while. So um, we had a chat uh, in an earlier session about how it's a little bit like, you know, you know that the, cr crime, the, the, the undercover cops know that the crimes are gonna happen, but you can't go arrest them until they actually go, uh, you know, burgle the, uh, the, the, the bank or whatever it is. What's the right point at which we can uh, intervene? Uh, sorry for that, uh, that uh, rabbit hole. Felipe, please. Yeah, so, so actually the, the, that uh, experience at the FDA where they were nearly convinced was similar to what happened when I presented the idea of general science to, is, to the whole institute directors. I worked for months preparing for, the, for that talk. And then in five minutes, they were convinced. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that the important thing is, uh, is I agree that the FDA in general is not our our they're not our enemy. They are not trying to be difficult. They had to comply with a lot of regulations. And those regulations were written a long time ago when the FDA was dealing with acute diseases. They're not appropriate for the current status where most of the diseases that they're dealing with are chronic diseases of the elderly. So I think that our uh, we should focus on convincing Congress actually to modify those rules and regulations so as to give the, the FDA the ability to respond to our request. Uh, Matt, last word on prepared remarks. We should do some audience Q&A, but please go ahead. Sure, thanks. Um, I just wanted to comment on, um, you know, I agree completely about, about needing to change or needing changes in the way that FDA regulates uh, drugs and, and the way they think about aging the culture there. One, one thing that I've observed, and I'm sort of surprised I haven't heard a lot of people talk about it is, you know, by targeting the biology of aging, it's not just prevention. It's not just, you know, slowing down the onset of diseases. We now know, at least in preclinical studies, in a variety of cases, you can actually reverse functional declines that go along with aging, right? And I don't see a lot of people talking about those functional declines as endpoints for clinical trials, but it seems to me as long as they're quantitative and you can measure them and potentially show improvement, that should fit very well with FDA approval. And so it just, I, I don't quite understand why more people aren't 
taking that approach. Um, but it's, you know, it seems like a viable path to me that, well, hold that on, should Matt. be explored. I mean, there, there aren't a lot of uh, therapies that can accomplish that yet. If there were, I mean, I completely agree that if we have rejuvenation therapies, you, you, you bypass a lot of the issues about very large, very long trials and validated surrogate markers. If you can make the blind see again, FDA will be happy to look at the evidence. Yeah. Well, but I think that's a little bit of a myth. I think most of the interventions we know about, again, this is preclinical, it's in mice, do have this property, at least the ones that are effective, that you can actually restore function in an aged animal. So again, I, you know, I would put rapamycin certainly in that category in the oral cavity, the immune system, the brain, the heart, there is very good evidence that you can take an old mouse already functionally declined and make it better. Obviously, we don't know that's going to work the same way in people, but it seems to me that you could design endpoints to go after that in a clinical trial. So this is, you have little, d different pieces that have to come together. Rapamycin seems to be something that I'd love to see clinical uh, data from. Uh, but you have to solve the market failure problem. Who's going to pay to develop that? Because there's nothing, there's no money to be made once you finish doing that. I wonder if we could just quickly turn to the some of the Q and A. Um, I see a couple of comments here about other sources of private funding, more money coming in, and we do have a session. Nir Barzilay is running a session on day three tomorrow on have we reached a tipping point in the global longevity ecosystem? And we have folks like Mahmoud uh, Khan, who's uh, who left uh, Life Biosciences to head uh, the Evolution Foundation, which is reputed to have plans to spend billions on geroscience. We have uh, uh, Victor Zhao, and he can describe his uh, the National Academy of Medicine initiative for the Global round, uh, Grand Round Challenge for Healthy Longevity. We have uh, uh, Sergey Young, who is one of the establishers of the X Prize for Longevity. So has there been a seed change? Is there a tipping point? We'll have some of those discussions. Now, I should also mention that with COVID, there's been a huge influx of new monies, money from, you know, we're no longer just looking at longevity sector investors, we're looking at general investors and new monies who haven't been in life sciences before. So we'll have some discussions about that. Um, I, I see Carl Flager asking a question, speaking of climate change, how do we prevent aging longevity from becoming politically polarized like climate change? Aging needs to remain nonpartisan completely agree. I'm thinking that I actually couldn't think of anything that was more susceptible to bipartisan interest. And in a, in a way, you have Newt Gingrich giving us a shout out. And I think we're going to have someone from across the aisle doing the same tomorrow, but uh, throwing out the question out generally to anybody who wants to comment on avoiding polarization in geroscience research. Steve. I think it's impossible. I mean, who would have thought that you could politicize uh, a life-saving, disease-preventing vaccine? Who, who would have imagined that? I, I would, in my wildest dream, never assume that that would be politicized. So I'm sure there are going to be the teenage advocates who say, no, 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 no. we want to get rid of those old people. Um, so I hope I'm wrong about that. I mean, Steve, you may be right, but that's a bit of a, what do you do then? It's kind of a year or point of view. Uh, uh, I, not, not, okay, uh, so David? I, oh, sorry, Tom? Just a quick point. I think there is something that you can do, which is make uh, an, an effort um, to um, identify both Democrats and Republicans who are interested in hearing about this. Uh, so that, you know, for example, if you have a bill introduced you've got a comparable number of Democratic and Republican right. uh, sponsors. So I, I agree that it's not something that you can ultimately control. And I would not have thought that an, a vaccine with a 95% efficacy rate and an incredibly good safety profile would become a partisan issue. So I, I take uh, Stephen's point, but I, I do think that there are proactive things that you can do to at least try. Tom, I couldn't agree more, and pardon me for jumping in here, but um, I do think this is actually a great opportunity for bipartisan seizing of the opportunity to do something that should be universally accepted. So let's just presume that it's going to happen, though um, we've got to to make it happen. I did want to go back as a former FDA person and, and respond to Matt Camberlin's great point 
And it really does come down to evidence. Uh, FDA said that loud and clear yesterday, just show us the evidence. And Matt is actually doing a study in dogs, which I believe exceptionally could even support a claim of a, a drug, if it were rapamycin, for example. But he's doing the study in animals or dogs. And I would say it would be highly persuasive if that study shows a survival benefit, that is, it's sort of the ultimate endpoint, and it's not really practical for us to, to use in, in, um, at the human level. But, but again, I think um, if we can show that, for example, sarcopenia is improved, um, that's a fairly demonstrable a clinical result. We talked a lot about that in our regulatory session yesterday. And the point is FDA should be willing to listen to the data that you could uh, decrease the rate of, of frailty related to uh, muscle weakness. And, and to do that in a way that uh, ultimately demonstrates a, a acceptable benefit risk relationship. Linda, maybe the last word, we're coming down to the last minute or two. So I, I was maybe adding to what was just said, responding to the question about how to think about healthy longevity as a nonpartisan issue. And it seems to me that it has huge value um, for people. Health is a good that people want um, pretty uniformly. Uh, so is not being disabled and not being frail. But, but more than that, it has huge return on investment for society to ha have people living longer with, with increased health span um, and less disability and frailty. And it, if done right, it would, in a way that would democratize the benefits to everyone, could also resolve health disparities. Well, I want to encourage both the panel and the attendees who are leaving several questions unanswered, uh, but we do have a forum, uh, a, a vehicle, the Catalis Institute virtual campus, uh, where we can continue these sorts of conversations beyond the conference and around the year and over the decade or so movement that's required in order to achieve healthy longevity for all. And we'd love to have input from uh, interested parties who are listening to this, uh, this conference and amongst uh, the, these uh, experts who are in the field itself so that we can actually, we, we didn't, wouldn't have just spent an hour talking about things. We'll now have some actionable steps that we can take that can actually get us uh, closer to uh, the goal that we, I think we all want. So with that, I wanna thank everybody.